So, here we have another issue of Reader's Digest magazine. And this one was definitely the most requested issue from the video where I showed all of the uh, different editions that I have, or volumes. And, um, this one was the most requested one to be read next. And this one is from April of 2019. And the title story is Unsolved Mysteries from Science, Crime, and History. So this one is nice. It's still in the crinkly plastic. So we're going to open this up and take a look inside and hopefully it's as interesting as as it sounds, okay? But of course I have to light a candle first and this is a woodwick candle it's a black cherry scent and it's just a tiny little tiny little version of this type of candle. So we'll light this candle here. Hopefully that sound calms down a little bit. Okay, well that uh, candle was just a little bit too loud. Uh, it sounded nice in person, but on the microphone it was too loud, so I switched it out for this little tea light. I think this is actually also a black cherry. Let's light this one. Okay, so there we go. Cut open the plastic. Like I said, this is from April of 2019, and the main story is Unsolved Mysteries from Science, Crime, and History. And also included in this issue is Your Brain's Hidden Powers, Retirement Plans for Any Family, 
Reader's Digest's tips for preventing cancer. Snake bite, a drama with teeth. And nine really practical jokes. So, I don't know if I'll read every single thing in here, but we'll see what we like the most. the cover story, Unsolved. These baffling mysteries have obsessed people for years. Are the answers out there? Let's see. A lifeline in the heartland. American farmers die by suicide at an alarming rate. One Iowa farmer therapist is determined to help. Great Ocean Secrets. Scientists are still searching for the truth about many creatures and features of the deep. We have nine really practical jokes. The Library, A Love Story The magic of these book-lined palaces <laughs> Filled Susan Orlean's childhood with delight Parenthood helped her feel that bliss again Then we have Death Rattle There was no warning Just a silent and deadly snake bite in Yosemite and anti-venom was 100 miles away. And this is um, inspiration. The true feeling of success. A man re-examines his life and discovers some unappreciated moments of joy. Flip through. And let's see. There's the genius section. Teach your brain new tricks. And some of the sections that are in every issue. Life in these United States. Laughter, the best medicine. All in a day's work. Laugh lines. And humor in uniform. And there's more. Everyday Heroes. This is called Breathe for Her. He was the last person who should have run into a burning building. He has lung disease, but that didn't stop him. stories in this one. Uh, I think I'll read this one first, though. This is the title of our cover story, Unsolved. Okay. Unsolved. These seven baffling mysteries have obsessed detectives 
scholars and explorers for years? Are the answers out there? Okay. The first one here is titled Diplomatic Crisis Sickening Noises. In December of 2016, a CIA officer checked in to the American Embassy's health office in Havana, suffering from nausea, headache, and dizziness. Days later, two more CIA officers reported similar ailments. By late 2018, the number grew to 26 Americans and 13 Canadians, experiencing nausea, hearing loss, vertigo, nosebleeds, and focusing issues. In all the cases, victims claimed that the symptoms were triggered by a strange noise they'd heard at their homes or hotel rooms. One person said the noise was high-pitched. Another described a beam of sound pointed into their rooms. Here, um, this talks about the Havana Syndrome. When diplomats serving in the American Embassy, one in Cuba, complained of ailments caused by sound waves, the American government accused Cuba of dirty tricks. The Cuban ambassador to the United States. denied the charges, and many in America believe him. So what caused the mysterious noises? Was it a malfunctioning listening device, or something as innocuous as crickets? So let's see some. Some insisted that the noise more closely resembled marbles rolling along the floor. The illnesses confounded medical experts. Doctors at the University of Pennsylvania who examined some of the victims diagnosed concussion-like symptoms but found no signs they'd suffered concussions. We know what you must be thinking. The Cuban government is up to something, right? The Cubans vehemently deny they're responsible, and many American investigators believe them. That's because they still don't know who or what made the victims sick. Was it a new type of weapon? The CIA claims it doesn't know of any weaponry that could cause these symptoms. What about ultrasound? One theory holds that a pair of covert eavesdropping devices placed too close to each other by Cuban agents may have inadvertently produced such a reaction, like the kind of feedback you hear when someone stands too close to a microphone. But the FBI has found no evidence to substantiate that argument. In fact, ultrasound is above the range of human hearing. Recordings of the sounds from some of the victims only added to the confusion. Two scientists who studied the recordings believe they captured the sound of lovelorn male crickets. One of the scientists, Alexander Stubbs at the University of California, Berkeley, says the insects are incredibly loud. You can hear them from inside a diesel truck going 40 miles an hour on the highway. Still, the scientists had no idea why the sounds might lead to illness in humans. Maybe it was just nerves. Cuba is a high-threat, high-stress post. A former embassy official told ProPublica.org 
Diplomats are warned that there will be surveillance. There will be listening devices in your house, probably in your car. For some people, that puts them in a high-stress mentality, in a threat anticipation mode. True, but then how to explain what happened in China? In May of 2018, an American posted in the consulate in Guangzhou, I know I'm saying that wrong, was diagnosed with the very same mystery illness. Ultimately, 15 Americans were evacuated. While the seemingly airborne cause of these brain injuries is still a mystery, the fallout is clear. The Americans removed 60% of their diplomats from Cuba and expelled 15 Cuban diplomats from Washington, D.C. The mysterious sounds may well be the opening shots in a new kind of Cold War. And the next one here is History Rewritten, Roaming Ruins. It's not unusual to find junk in Brazil's Guanabara Bay, but what Robert Marx unearthed there in 1982 was an unusual kind of foreign matter. In an underwater field the size of three tennis courts, Located 15 miles from shore lay the remains of some 200 Roman ceramic jars, a few fully intact. According to Marx, a professional treasure hunter, the jars appeared to be twin-handled amphorae that were used to transport goods such as grains and wine in the 3rd century. But how did they get there? The first Europeans didn't reach Brazil until 1500. The Romans, who traded primarily in Mediterranean port cities and the Middle East, had little incentive to invest in ships that could cross oceans. However, they did sail as far as India. Perhaps some untrained navigator lost his way in a storm, or maybe mutineers steered the ship westward. We may never know, nor are we likely to uncover more evidence. Brazil closed the Bay of Jars to further research in 1983 in an effort to deter looters, it said. Marx claims the government didn't want the area explored because finding Roman-era artifacts there would mean that, contrary to Brazil's official history, the Portuguese were not the first Europeans to reach the country, and the truth is resting 100 feet under the sea. visions. Identical twins Jillian and Jennifer Pollock were born on October 4th, 1958 into a family scarred by tragedy. On a Sunday morning in May of 1957, their older sisters Jacqueline, 6, and Joanna, 11, had been struck and killed by a car while walking hand-in-hand to church 
in their small English parish of Hexham. When the twins arrived 17 months later, their grieving father, John Pollock, was certain they were actually his dead daughters, reborn. Their mother, Florence Pollock, wasn't so sure, but then odd things happened. When the twins began talking, they would ask for the same toys their sisters had played with. Toys that could not have known, sorry, toys they could not have known existed, because they had long been stored away. Although the Pollocks had left Hexham when the twins were less than a year old, when they brought them for a visit, their first at age four, the twins pointed out locations that had been meaningful to their sisters, but which the twins had never seen, such as the school the deceased sisters had attended and their favorite playground. Even more chilling were the twins' apparent memories of the deaths of their sisters. Up until the age of five, each suffered recurring nightmares of being run over by a car. These nightmares sometimes evolved into daytime terrors. The car, it's coming for us, the twins would shriek at the mere sound of a car engine firing up in a small alleyway. Florence, a reincarnation skeptic, couldn't think of any rational explanation for how the twins had come to act out their sister's agonizing final moments with such apparent accuracy. The blood's coming out of your eyes, Jillian would cry, cradling her sister's head tenderly in her arms as John and Florence looked on in horror. It's where the car hit you. In 1963, Dr. Ian Stevenson, an expert on reincarnation at the University of Virginia, began to study the Pollock sisters, finding no evidence that the twins' apparent past life memories had been manufactured or suggested by their parents. He concluded it was virtually impossible not to believe they were living proof of reincarnation. The twins' memories gradually faded as they reached adolescence. Then, for a brief period in her early twenties, Jillian experienced a series of visions of herself as a young child playing in a sandbox, surrounded by gardens and an orchard. The Pollocks immediately recognized that as their home in Wickham, the village where they lived with Joanna in the years before Jacqueline had been born. Had been born. The catch? Jillian had never been to Wickham. The next story here is um, about mass, mass murder, missing on a mountain. On January 23rd, 1959, nine college students and their tour guide, Igor uh, Dyatlov, set out on what was to be a 21-day hiking excursion through the Ural Mountains in the former USSR. On February 2nd, the group skied down Mount Otorten, English translation, Mount Don't Go There. On February 12th, when the group was scheduled to return home, only one student, 21-year-old, Yuri Yudin had arrived, and he had left the group early because of illness. When none of the others came home, a search party was organized. 
what the searchers found would haunt them. On February 26th, they discovered the hiker's tent. It had been sliced open from the inside. There were multiple pairs of snowy footprints, some made with bare feet leading away from it. The bodies of the first two hikers were found wearing only underwear beneath a tall cedar tree, the flesh on their hands raw and pulpy from attempting to scramble up the trunk. The next two were found one day later, and another hiker six days later, all showing signs of hypothermia. One had a fractured skull. It wasn't until the spring thaw began in May that the remaining four were discovered under 13 feet of snow in a ravine 82 yards from the cedar tree. Three had clearly died of severe internal injuries consistent with a tremendous physical impact comparable to a car crash, including skull and rib fractures, yet none bore visible external injuries. It was as if a deadly force had crushed them without having actually touched them. They had all apparently died on the 11th day of their trip, February 2nd, the last day on which any of them had written in their journals. The investigation continued, and in late May it took a shocking turn. Some of the hikers' clothing tested positive for radioactivity. On May 28, 1959, one day after the Soviet military got wind of the results of the radiation testing, the investigation was summarily closed. The official conclusion, the hikers had met with an unnamed, overwhelming force. Of course, that abrupt announcement just intensified public speculation. Theories have included an explosion of a Soviet test missile, a UFO attack, hallucinogenic drugs, and even a Bigfoot-like monster. If I had a chance to ask God just one question, said Yudin, the one surviving skier who died in 2013 at age 75, it would be... What really happened to my friends that night? Their memory, at least, lives on at the spot where they died. It is now called the um, Dyatlov Pass. And now this story here. This one is called Brain Sickness Epidemic. Living Statues From 1917 to 1928, half a million people were afflicted with a ghastly condition that could be part of the plot line of a horror film. The victims, very much alive and conscious, found themselves in inexplicably frozen states, their static bodies prisons for their minds. Encephalitis lethargica, or EL, aka the sleeping sickness, first appeared in Europe and quickly spread around the world, reaching epidemic levels in North America, Europe, and India by 1919. About a third of those stricken with the illness died. Of the survivors, nearly half eventually found themselves unable to physically interact with the world around them. All the while fully aware of their surroundings, though occasionally capable of limited speech, 
eye motion and even laughter. They generally appeared as living statues, totally motionless for hours, days, weeks, or years. The cause is unknown, but one theory is brain inflammation triggered by a rare strain of streptococcus, the bacteria responsible for many sore throats each year. Science's best guess is that the bacteria mutated, provoking the immune system to attack the brain, leaving the victim helpless. None of this explains why the illness disappeared, only to resurface sporadically, be it in Europe in the 1950s or in China ten years ago. When a 12-year-old girl was hospitalized for five weeks with the disease. Are such occurrences the new normal? Or are they signs that E.L. could be planning something bigger any day? A 2004 analysis of 20 patients with symptoms remarkably similar to E.L. concluded that whatever ailed them is still prevalent. As such, history's so-called sleeping sickness remains the stuff of night. This next story here, this is called The Perfect Crime, Vanishing Hijacker. On the night before Thanksgiving, 1971, a middle-aged man wearing a business suit boarded a commercial flight headed from Portland, Oregon to Seattle. He ordered a bourbon and soda, then calmly informed a flight attendant that he had a bomb in his attache case. Having gotten her attention, he dictated the following message to the cockpit. I want $200,000 by 5 p.m. in cash. Put it in a, in a knapsack. I want two back parachutes and two front parachutes. When we land, I want a fuel truck ready to refuel. No funny stuff or I'll do the job. His boarding pass read, Dan Cooper, but thanks to a communication error, the newspapers identified him more cryptically as D.B. Over the next two hours, D.B. Cooper never took off his dark glasses. He nursed a second bourbon and waited patiently while the plane circled Puget Sound. He seemed rather nice, one of the hijacked flight attendants later said. On the ground, authorities scrambled to assemble the cash, parachutes, and fuel truck while the 36 passengers on board were led to believe the delay was entirely routine. Upon landing in Seattle and receiving a knapsack full of $20 bills, and four parachutes, Cooper released the passengers and all but four of the crew. He demanded to be flown on to Mexico City, but first he had one final instruction. He was to be left alone in the cabin. As the plane took off at about 7.40 p.m., the four-person crew huddled in the cockpit. Per Cooper, the plane flew below 10,000 feet at a speed slower than 200 knots, too low and slow for military jets to follow closely. Just 20 minutes later, a warning light flashed, indicating that the rear door had been opened 
and its staircase deployed. When the plane landed in Reno, Nevada for refueling, the cabin was empty. Cooper had taken his knapsack and parachuted off into the night. Not a single witness saw him jump. He was never seen again. The ransom money, identifiable through serial numbers, was never used. Did Cooper plummet to his death? Did he survive only to somehow lose the knapsack? Or had the money been merely an afterthought, more of a means of spinning a story for the newspapers and for history? The FBI spent the next nine years trying to find the answers. Then in 1980, a boy camping in rural Washington discovered three wads of cash along the banks of the Columbia River, which the FBI later identified as a portion of the ransom. But the trail remained cold until 2018, when a man named Carl Lauren presented the FBI with an audio tape of his deceased friend, Walter Arica, Arica, confessing to being D.B. Cooper. Around the same time, a documentary filmmaker named Thomas Colbert was building a case that Cooper was actually 74-year-old Robert Rackstraw. Rackstraw, a former Special Forces paratrooper with 22 different aliases, had been a person of interest early on, but he was cleared in 1979. Colbert based his claim in part on a letter Cooper allegedly sent to the Washington Post that included the number 717171. In Vietnam, Rackstraw was in the 371st Regiment, or 371s. Neither of those stories was enough to convince the FBI, which is why the case of D.B. Cooper remains the only unsolved skyjacking in the history of American aviation. So I think there's just one more story in these unsolved mysteries. So, let's see. Sudden Extinction. The world, the New World's Lost Colony. In March of 1590, John White finally left England on a rescue mission to Roanoke Colony the first permanent English settlement in North America. White was Roanoke's governor, but he had been away gathering food and supplies to bring back to the struggling colony, almost since its founding in 1587. The fate of Roanoke's residents had weighed heavily on his mind, and for good reason. Among those he left on the island, part of what is now North Carolina's Outer Banks, were his wife, his daughter, and his infant granddaughter, who was the first English child born in the New World. White returned to Roanoke on August 8, 1590, and found nothing. The entire settlement was abandoned its homes and battlements dismantled. It was as if the entire colony of 115 had vanished. The only hint of Roanoke's fate was the world Croat Croatoan what is that? I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. C-R-O-A-T-O-A-N carved onto a fence post and the letters C-R-O carved onto a tree. 
since White had instructed his colonists to carve a Maltese cross on a tree if they were moved by force. The absence of one gave White hope that the settlers had relocated to nearby um, Croatoan Island. I know I'm not saying that right. Croatoan Island, which was inhabited by the friendly Croatoan tribe. Unfortunately for White, he never did discover what happened to the colony. Soon after he arrived in Roanoke, a series of storms battered his ships, forcing his team back to their boats and eventually back to England. With an ocean once again between him and his family, a devastated White surrendered Roanoke to his unknown fate. So what happened to the lost colonists? Perhaps they were abducted by Native Americans or moved inland to join a friendly tribe. Maybe they were slaughtered by Spaniards marching up from Florida or tried to sail back to England on their own and got lost at sea. Archaeologists have yet to come up with any sign of the lost colony and time is running out. Shoreline erosion threatens the island, making the lost colonists' outcome more of a mystery each passing day. Okay, so that I think is the last of the unsolved mysteries. I wish there were some more, but... So, let's see, down here I'll look through and read some more things too. This is the story about the American farmers. American farmers die by suicide at nearly twice the rate of the general population. A lifeline in the heartland. When the 1980s farm crisis hit, Mike Rossman moved home to Marion, Iowa, near the farm where he grew up. Now this story, I didn't think I would read, but oh, I started reading a little bit. It is dark in the workshop, but what light there is streams in patches through the windows. Cobwebs coat the wrenches, the cans of spray paint, and the rungs of an old wooden chair where Matt Peters used to sit. A stereo plays country music left on by the renter who now uses the shop. It smells so good in here, I say like men working. I love that smell. <laughs> Finishes Ginny Peters. We inhale, yes. Ginny pauses at the desk where she found the letter from Matt, her husband, on the night he died. My dearest love, it began, and it continued for pages. I have torment in my head. On the morning of his last day, May 12, 2011, Matt stood in the kitchen of their farmhouse. I can't think, he told Ginny. I feel paralyzed. It was planting season and stress was high. Matt worried about the weather and worked around the clock to get his crop in the ground on time. He hadn't slept in three nights and was struggling to make decisions. I remember thinking, I wish I could pick you up and put you in the car like you do with a child, Ginny says. And then I remember thinking, and take you where? Who can help me with this? I felt so alone. Ginny felt what she describes as an oppressive sense of dread. 
that intensified as the day wore on. At dinner time, Matt's truck was gone, and he wasn't answering his phone. It was dark when she found the letter. I just knew, she says. She called 911 immediately, but by the time the authorities located his truck, Matt had taken his life. Ginny describes her husband as strong and determined, funny and loving. They raised two children together. He would burst through the door singing the Mighty Mouse song. Here I come to save the day and make everyone laugh. He embraced new ideas and was progressive in his farming practices. One of the first in his county to practice no-till, a farming method that does not disturb the soil. In everything he did, he wanted to be a giver and not a taker, she says. After his death, Ginny says, she began combing through Matt's things. Every scrap of paper, everything I could find that would make sense of what had happened. His phone records show a 20-minute call to an unfamiliar number on the afternoon he died. When she dialed the number, Mike Rossman answered. My name is Virginia Peters, she said. My husband died of suicide on May 12th. There was a pause on the line. I have been so worried, said Mike. Mrs. Peters, I'm so glad you called me. Matt had made an appointment to talk to Mike again, but when the time came, he hadn't called. Mike Rossman, an Iowa farmer, is a psychologist and one of the nation's leading experts on the behavioral health of farmers. His mission is to help those in crisis, and for 40 years he has worked to understand why so many farmers take their own lives. A 2018 analysis by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention suggests that male farmers die by suicide at nearly twice the rate of the general population, and this could be an underestimate as the data did not include several major agricultural states. It's also hard to capture an accurate number because some farmers disguise their suicides as accidents. Mike looks like a Midwestern Santa Claus. Glasses perched on a kind, round face, a head of white hair, and a bushy white mustache. In 1979, he and his wife, Marilyn Rossman, left their teaching positions at the University of Virginia and bought 190 acres in Harlan, Iowa, near the farm where Mike spent his boyhood. Mike told colleagues, I need to go take care of farmers, because nobody else does. Now, this is a long story, so I just wanted to uh, read a little bit of it. But it talks about how Mike began providing free counseling. There was telephone hotlines in most agricultural states. Every state that had a hotline reported a significant drop in the number of farming-related suicides. In 1999, Mike joined an organization called Sowing Seeds of Hope, which referred farmers to affordable behavioral health services. It fielded more than 250,000 calls from farmers, trained more than 10,000 rural behavioral health professionals. Um, It became the model for the nationwide farm and ranch 
Stress Assistance Network. Currently 80% of rural residents live in areas with a shortage of mental health professionals. Hope may be on the horizon. Though, as the 2018 Farm Bill included $10 million in annual funding through 2023. So down here it says where to find help. Many states offer mental health resources for farmers. Most will help people in need regardless of location. These national organizations are also good places to start. The Farm Aid Hotline, which is 1-800-F-A-R-M-A-I-D or 1-800-327-6243. Uh, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255. Okay, this one is about um, Great Ocean Secrets. It has been nearly 150 years since the publication of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And scientists are still searching for the truth about many of the creatures and features of the deep. Look at this jellyfish. That's a crazy picture. This is called the immortal jellyfish. Could this tiny jelly hold the secret to curing cancer? Smaller than a pinky nail. Oh. This creature has the Benjamin Button-like ability to revert to its polyp state, the earliest stage of its life, when threatened with starvation or injury, earning the nickname Immortal Jellyfish for how it appears to outsmart death. Although the species, um, Teratopsis dorni, has been known about for a hundred years. Researchers didn't discover this capacity until the 1990s. They are now wondering whether the jellyfish's ability to regress and regrow could help fight diseases such as cancer in humans. Is the giant oar fish. These snake-like creatures are the longest bony fish on earth. They can grow to up to 56 feet, but they live at depths of around um, 3,300 feet. So not much is known about them. Two dead giant oarfish were found on California's shores in 2013, prompting scientists to study samples from their remains to see whether storms, starvation, or illness potentially caused their deaths. Jeez. This is the purple orb. In 2016, re researchers found a single purple blob about the size of a pool ball in an underwater canyon off California's coast. Stumped as to what it could be, they nicknamed it Blobus Purpleus. <laughs> Research is ongoing, but one hypothesis is that it is distantly related to snails. Challenger D. 
deep. This spot in the ocean near Guam is the deepest point on Earth, nearly seven miles down. Mount Everest is only 5.5 miles tall. Huh. Located in the Mariana Trench, Challenger Deep has been visited by just three people, two oceanographers in 1960 and filmmaker James Cameron in 2012. It's completely dark and only a few degrees above freezing in the trench, and the pressure is intense. Eight tons per square inch, but marine life has managed to thrive. In fact, some researchers believe that life on Earth may have originated there. And down here, the Yonaguni Monument. Are they human-made steps and ancient pyramids that sank in an earthquake, or natural rock formations created by currents? These underwater structures off the coast of Japan, often called Japan's Atlantis, have baffled experts since a diver found them in 1986. Let's see, this here. The Milky Sea Phenomenon. Since the 17th century, sailors have reported encountering swaths of sea with a strange milky cast as far as the eye could see, but scientists were unable to explain it or confirm it was real. Then in 1995, a satellite captured an image of a milky sea off the coast of Somalia. It is thought that the glow was from luminous bacteria that attract fish in order to be eaten and survive in their guts. How the bacteria gather in numbers large enough for their bioluminescence to be seen from space is unknown. Let's see, blue whales. Blue whales are the largest animals to ever live. Even a newborn can weigh roughly 30 tons. The 11,500 foot waterfall. Earth's largest waterfall is actually underwater, beneath the Denmark Strait, where cold water sinks below warmer water and flows over an estimated 11,500 foot drop. Researchers are still trying to figure out how such a thing works. It must, it's much more powerful than waterfalls on land, with a downward flow of more than 123 million cubic feet per second, which creates what scientists describe as massive turbulence. And over here about the whales again. Blue whales, the largest animal in history. The blue whale has a tongue that can weigh as much as an entire elephant. Still, scientists don't know how long they live or much else about them. When researchers captured a rare video of blue whales off the coast of Sri Lanka in 2007, I'm sorry, 2017, it sparked controversy among experts. Were they racing or mating? Here's the section on nine really practical jokes. Okay. Some jokes just make you chuckle and thank goodness for them, but some punchlines make you stop mid laugh and actually think. Okay. Let's see. An elderly woman is watching her grandson play on the beach. 
when a huge wave comes in and sweeps him out to sea. Frantic, she falls down on her knees and pleads, Please, God, save my only grandchild. Please, I beg you, bring him back. Suddenly, another wave comes in and delivers the boy onto the beach, as good as new. The grandmother looks up to heaven and shouts, He had a hat. In other words, don't be a jerk. A little gratitude goes a long way. Okay. Let's see, number two. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson go on a camping trip. After a good dinner and a bottle of wine, they retire for the night. Some hours later, Holmes wakes up and nudges his faithful friend. Watson, look up at the sky and tell me what you see. I see millions and millions of stars, Holmes replies. I mean, Holmes replies Watson. And what do you deduce from that? Watson ponders for a minute, then says, Well, astronomically, it tells me that there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Astrologically, I observe that Saturn is in Leo. (laughs) Meteorologically, I suspect that we will have a beautiful day tomorrow. Theologically, I can see that God is all-powerful and that we are a small and insignificant part of the universe. But what does it tell you, Holmes? Watson, you idiot, Holmes says. Someone has stolen our tent. (laughs) In other words, hey genius, smarts aren't always a substitute for common sense. One evening over dinner, a boy asked his father, Dad, are bugs good to eat? That's disgusting, said the father. You know the rules. We don't talk about things like that while we're eating. After dinner, the dad asked, Now, what was it you wanted, son? Oh, never mind, dad, the boy said. There was a bug in your soup, but now it's gone. In other words, if you get stuck on following the rules, you might learn things the hard and crunchy way. A doctor walks into the examining room and puts his hand on his patient's shoulder. I'm afraid I have some bad news. You're dying, and you don't have much time left. Oh no, says the patient. How long do I have to live? Ten, says the doctor. Ten, cries the panicked patient. Ten what? Days? Weeks? Months? The doctor calmly replies, nine. (laughs) In other words, life is short, and getting shorter every day. Might as well grab a Krispy Kreme. story about the the library. Let's see what this one says. Um, the magic of these book-lined buildings. Says, I grew up in libraries, or at least it feels that way. I was raised in the suburbs of Cleveland, just a few blocks from the brick-faced Bertram Woods branch of the Shaker Heights Public Library system. I went there several times a week with my mother. She and I would walk in together, but as soon as we passed through the door, we each headed to our favorite section. The library might have been the first place I was ever given autonomy. Even when I was maybe four or five years old, I was allowed to head off on my own. Then after a while, my mother and I would reunite at the checkout counter with our finds. Together, we'd wait as the librarian pulled out the date card and stamped it with the checkout machine. That giant fist-thumping card with a loud chunk-chunk. 
printing a crooked due date underneath a score of previous crooked due dates that belong to other people, other times. Those visits were dreamy, frictionless interludes that promised I would leave richer than I'd arrived. It wasn't like going to a store with my mom, which guaranteed a tug of war between what I wanted and what my mother was willing to buy me. In the library, I could have anything I wanted. After we checked out, I loved being in the car and having all the books we'd gotten stacked on my lap, pressing me under their solid, warm weight, their mylar covers sticking a bit to my thighs. It was such a thrill leaving a place with things you hadn't paid for, such a thrill anticipating the new books we would read. On the ride home, my mom and I talked about the order in which we were going to read our books. A solemn conversation in which we planned how to pace ourselves through this charmed, evanescent period of grace until the books were due. When I was older, I usually walked to the library by myself, lugging back as many books as I could carry. Occasionally, I did go with my mother, and the trip would be as enchanted as it had been when I was small. Even when I was in my last year of high school and could drive myself to the library. My mother and I still went together now and then, and the trip unfolded exactly as it had when I was a child, with all the same beats and pauses and comments and reveries, the same perfect, pensive rhythm we'd followed so many times before. When I miss my mother these days, since she died two years ago, I like to picture us in the car together, going for one more magnificent trip to the Bertram Woods, or to Bertram Woods. My parents valued books, but they grew up in the Depression. Aware of the quicksilver nature of money, and they had learned the hard way that you shouldn't buy what you could borrow. Because of that frugality, or perhaps independent of it, they also believed that you read a book for the experience of reading it. You didn't read it in order to have an object that had to be housed and looked after forever. A memento of the purpose for which it was obtained. The reading of a book was a journey. There was no need for souvenirs. Our uncrowded bookshelves at home had several sets of encyclopedias, an example of something not convenient to borrow from the library, since you reached for it regularly and urgently, and an assortment of other books that, for one reason or another, my parents had ended up with. There were some travel guides, some coffee table books, a few of my father's law books, and a dozen or so novels that were either gifts or somehow managed to justify being owned outright. When I left for college, one of the many ways I differentiated myself from my parents was that I went wild for owning books. I think buying textbook was what textbooks was what got me going all i know is that i lost my appreciation for the slow pace of making your way through a library and for having books on borrowed time as soon as i got my own apartment i lined it with bookcases and loaded them with hard covers i turned into a ravenous buyer of books I loved the alkaline tang of new ink and paper, a smell that never emanated from a broken library book. I loved the crack of a newly flexed spine, and the way the brand new pages felt almost damp, as if they were wet with creation. Sometimes I fantasized about starting a bookstore. If my mother ever mentioned to me that she was on the waiting list for some book at the library, I got annoyed and asked why she didn't just go buy it. 
I might have spent the rest of my life thinking about libraries only wistfully, the way I thought about, say, the amusement park I went to as a kid. Libraries might have become just a bookmark of memory, more than an actual place, a way to call up an emotion of a moment that occurred long ago, something that was fused with mother and the past in my mind. But in 2011, my husband accepted a job in Los Angeles, so we left New York and headed west. My son was in first grade when we moved. One of his first school assignments was to interview someone who worked for the city. I suggested talking to a garbage collector or a police officer. But he said he wanted to interview a librarian. We were so new to town that we had to look up the address of the closest library which was the Los Angeles Public Library's Studio City Branch. It was about a mile away from our house, about the same distance that the Bertram Woods Branch had been from my childhood home. As my son and I drove to meet the librarian, I was flooded by a sense of absolute familiarity, a gut-level recollection of this journey of parent and child on their way to the library. I had taken this trip so many times before, but now it was turned on its head, and I was the parent bringing my child on that special trip. We parked, and my son and I walked toward the library, taking it in for the first time. The building was white and modish, modish, with a mint green mushroom cap of a roof. From the outside, it didn't look like anything like the stout brick Bertram Woods branch, but when we stepped in, the thunderbolt of recognition struck me so hard that it made me gasp. Decades had passed, and I was 2,000 miles away, but I felt as if I had been whisked back to that pre precise time and place walking into the library with my mother. Nothing had changed. There was the same soft tisk 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 of pencil on paper, and the muffled murmuring from patrons at the tables in the center of the room, and the creak and groan of book carts, <laughs> and the occasional papery clunk of a book dropped on a desk. The scarred wooden checkout counters and the librarian's desks as big as boats, and the bulletin board with its fluttering raggedy notices were all the same. The sense of gentle, steady busyness, like a pot of water on a rolling boil, was just the same. The books on the shelves with some subtractions and additions were certainly the same. It wasn't that time stopped in the library. It was as if it were captured here, collected here, and in all libraries. And not only my time, my life, but all human time as well. In the library, time is dammed up, not just stopped, but saved. The library is a gathering pool of narratives, and of the people who come to find them. It is where we can glimpse immortality. In the library, we can live forever. So the spell that libraries had once cast on me was renewed. Maybe it had never really been broken. Although I had been away long enough that it was like visiting a country I loved but had forgotten as my life went galloping by. I knew that part of what hooked me had been the shock of familiarity I felt when I took my son to our local library. The way it telegraphed my childhood, my relationship to my parents, my love of books, it brought me close in my musings to my mother and to our so sojourns to the library. It was wonderful and it was bittersweet, because
because just as I was rediscovering those memories, my mother was losing all of hers. When I first told her that I was writing a book about libraries, she was delighted and said that she was proud that she'd had a part in making me find them wondrous. But soon the dark fingers of dementia got, got her in their grip and they pried loose bits of her memory every day. The next time I reminded her about the project and I told her how much I had been thinking about our trips to Bertram Woods, she smiled with encouragement but with no apparent recognition of what I meant. Each time I visited, she receded a little more. She became vague, absent, isolated in her thoughts, or maybe in some pillowy blankness that filled in where the memories had been chipped away, and I knew that I was carrying the remembrance for both of us. The writer Amadou Hampate um, Vance said that in Africa, when an old person dies, it is like a library has burned. When I first heard the phrase, I didn't understand it, but over time I came to realize it was perfect. Our minds and souls contain volumes inscribed by our experiences and emotions. Each individual's consciousness is a collection of memories we've cataloged and stored inside us a private library of a life lived. It is something that no one else can entirely share. It burns down and disappears when we die. But if you can take something from your internal collection and share it with one person or with the larger world, on the page or in a story told, it takes on a life of its own. This is the section on humor in uniform. Um, let's see if there's something else. I don't want to read the whole thing because I think this video is already pretty long. This is the story for the section drama in real life. This is about um, someone who got bit by a snake. There was no warning, just a silent and deadly bite in a remote area of Yosemite. An anti-venom was 100 miles away. So that's a long story there. This one is in the inspiration section, and it's called The True Feeling of Success. Let's see, that one is not too long, so I'll read this one. Let's see. Um, a man examines his life and discovers some unappreciated moments of joy. Okay. I was having coffee this morning with a dear friend who's going through a difficult time at work. In one of those moments that, you, that make you wonder who's winding the clock of life, my phone buzzed while we were sitting there. It was an email from my old friend, Ryan, and all I saw was the subject line, success. Some 17 years ago, Ryan and I were sports writers at competing small newspapers in Virginia's Shenandoah Valley. 
We had about a half dozen high schools, a Division III university, and a summer baseball league in our coverage area. In that lava-hot turf war, we somehow became friends. We've kept in touch, but it had been a few months since we'd talked when this, curi when this curiously timed email arrived. He said he was preparing a speech for the next week. He's now a project manager for a research firm near Washington. And the speech he was going to give was titled, How Do You Define Success? I've contributed to a publication called Success. So he turned the question to me. How do you define success? I thought of my coffee conversation and typed this. Hey man, good to hear from you again, and good timing. Your email came in just as I was chatting with another friend who's going through one of those rough spells at work. I wish I had better advice. What a broad question. You know, after I left the Shenandoah Valley, my next job was in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. I made 22500 a year, and this was 2005, not a generation ago. The two other sports writers on staff, Travis and Jeff, were in their mid-twenties, too. Honestly, we'd come to Rocky Mount to leave Rocky Mount. We spent our time talking about what life must be like at a real newspaper. We griped about our shop and drooled over the Charlotte Observer and the Raleigh News and Observer. What resources they had. Writers who covered only one team and didn't have to lay out pages or proofread box scores. Talk about living the dream. If we could just get to one of those places, then we could go somewhere else. Travis, Jeff, and I bonded over our desire to part ways. We ate dinner together, went out to cover our games, and came back to help send the final pages to the printer by our 1.30 a.m. deadline. On the best nights, we'd grab the news editors and copy editors and play wiffle ball in the parking lot until 4 a.m., laughing and joking until almost sunrise. We all left there within a year, as intended. Travis eventually landed a big-time job covering the Pittsburgh Pirates and he now has a New York Times best-selling sports book about baseball. Jeff became one of the most well-known NASCAR writers in the country, with almost 200,000 Twitter followers. Now he's got his own media company that's doing quite well. In 2017, Jeff and I went to a Charlotte Knights game, and he said something about Rocky Mount that I won't forget. I didn't appreciate it then, but honestly, when I look back, it's probably the best time I've ever had in my career. What is success? Buddy, I don't know. On those late nights, it was making good contact on Travis's curveball. Now, it's running a tenth of a mile farther than I did last week. Or the sound of a storm door latching shut after I install it myself. Or, the morning Laura said yes. More than a year ago, I wrote a story and no readers yelled at me about it, which these days is a success. But nobody said anything nice either, so is it a failure? I don't know. College students ask me for advice every now and then, if you can believe it. Maybe that's success. But last night, an editor at a publication I've been dying to write for replied to a pitch with the murderous words, This just isn't the right fit for us. And I scanned job boards for a new line of work. 
Maybe it's beyond work, though. In June 2018, my dad visited and made it the whole weekend without falling while transferring to his wheelchair. That's a victory. To another person, though, success might be a senior discount on McDonald's coffee or a night sleeping on a bench without getting wet or the last meeting with a parole officer. You get the point. Maybe success isn't measured in achievements or being happy with who you are or any of the cliches in self-help books on this matter. Goals and personal peace are selfish markers, and I don't mean to imply selfishness is a bad thing, not at all. Selfishness is the axis of humankind, from cavemen to astronauts to saints on earth. Individual accomplishments bring community accomplishments, bring worldwide accomplishments. But all of the accomplishments in the universe may not leave you feeling successful, right? I'm rambling here, I know. But the point is, maybe success is a smaller calculation. Something more like what Jeff hinted at. Maybe success is having the wherewithal to be grateful at the precise moment you have something to be grateful for. Thank you for writing, old friend, Mike. And then they ask... Oh, some of the um, readers write in about what they define success as. I'll just read one here. And this one here, it says, In the words attributed to Ralph Waldo Emerson, success is... To know even one life has breathed easier because you have lived. That is success to me. <laughs> Retiring early. <laughs> That's a good one. And let's see. This is the section, uh, the genius section. Teach your brain new tricks. I don't really want to read the whole some little brain games in there. This one's about how to memorize anything. Um, say I asked you to memorize this list of ten words. Ladybug, comb, oatmeal, lawyer, coal, stamp, knife, word, I mean, I'm sorry, worm, bell, lettuce. You'd normally have to repeat them in your head many times before you achieved 100% recall. Um, even after accomplishing the tiring feat a few hours later, you'd probably remember only two to three words from the beginning and end of the list. Um, that's because of what cognitive psychologists call the primacy and recency effects. Information at the beginning and end of series interferes with recall of information in the middle of a series. This difficulty stems from the limitations of our verbal memory. The linguistic portion of our brains where we store arbitrary lists of words has limited storage. However, our visual brains have vastly more storage than our linguistic brains. Thus, when you store information visually as opposed to linguistically, 
you can recall it much better. And that's the secret to remembering the ten words above. Instead of repeating the words in your head, convert them to images. And not just any images, but extremely vivid pictures. Then visualize your house and mentally place the image of each object on the list in a different room or a distinct location, such as a closet within the house. For instance, place a very large ladybug, say three feet in diameter to make it really vivid, where the welcome mat would lie by the front door. Then deposit a large orange comb on the floor just inside the front door. Continue to place each successive object on the list throughout your house. Preferably in the order you would take someone on a guided tour. When you're done, take another stroll through your home and see the objects you've left in different places. You should have no trouble visualizing each and every object and thus each and every word. You can use the same trick to memorize strings of numbers, letters, symbols, or anything else. Just convert what you're memorizing into something meaningful. For example, the number two might be represented by an image of you and your spouse. That's funny, because that's how I remember what to buy at the store. I don't make a list, but I I say to myself, um, I, rem I always walk through the store in the same um, path. And I just remember, okay, I need two things from this section, and then I'll remember what they are. I remember that I need one thing from this section, and I kind of go through the store in my head just to remember the things that I need. That's so funny. So, um... at the end, the photo finish, where people write in to make a caption for the picture. And there's the picture. And the winner was Laundry Day. <laughs> That's good. Um, runner, the runners-up were This pair of hairs uses turtle wax on their snowboards. And the last one, Easter Peeps on Vacation. <laughs> I know there's a lot more in here, but I think the video is too long. Let's see, I know I missed a lot in the front. Um, the food on your plate. Um, oh no, I'm not going to read that. And this is all in a day's work. Maybe I'll just read one. Um, I was in the emergency room when a young male nurse came in to ask routine medical questions. Nurse, have you ever had a hysterectomy? Me, yes. Nurse, when? Me, 2011. Nurse, do you think you could be pregnant? Me. Do you think this is the right career for you? Let's see. This one says, The girl I babysit has made me watch Wally at least ten times. So I assumed it was her favorite movie. Today, her mom told me that she watches it because she thinks it's mine. Um, different little things on health, world of, world of medicine, 
laughter. Laughter is the best medicine. <laughs> it's cute. This picture here where the guy has the collar on that we put on dogs. It says, it keeps me from looking at my phone every two seconds. <laughs> and here's six quick gags that might take a minute. I was going to tell a time-traveling joke, but you guys didn't like it. <laughs> my three favorite things are eating my family and not using commas. Wait, what? <laughs> but it's going to take me a minute. My three favorite things are eating, eating my family and not using commas. Okay. Um... Accordion to a recent survey, replacing words with the names of musical instruments in sentences often goes undetected. Okay. I wanted to marry my English teacher when she got out of jail, but apparently you can't end a sentence with a proposition. I, I don't get it. <laughs> when she got out of jail, maybe. <laughs> um... See, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody hears, my illegal logging business is a success. R.I.P. Boiling water. You will be missed. M.I.S.T. And there's more here. And let's see, this, the doctor is insane. You can prevent many cancers. Oh, I'm not going to read each one, but I'll just say what the main suggestion is. It says, wear a hat. Consider taking baby aspirin. Indulge in a daily cup of gel. Ditch or dim screens before bed. Check your home for radon. Spend less time sitting. Get screened for hepatitis C. Cut out alcohol, rethink that ham sandwich, even if the package says nitrate free, get the HPV shot, question the need for a CT scan, switch to glass for food storage and heating, and don't count on vitamin D. Nine ways to improve your life. Remove water stains from wood. How to get rid of drain flies. Sit comfortably in any chair. How to not let your leather weather. Book a cruise ASAP. Plan for a retirement at any age. Quotable quotes. Let's see. Life doesn't often spell things out for you or give you what you want exactly when you want it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be called life. 
It would be called Vending Machine. That's from Lauren Graham. The great thing about ideas is that every new idea leads to two more. Ideas breed. It's Jeff Bezos. Never stop worrying. Live each day as if your rent is due tomorrow. That's um, Carl Hyacin. No matter where you are in the world, somebody will be worse off than you. And if you think like that, you will always have the mindset to give back. And that's Priyanka Chopra. Try to be a rainbow in someone's cloud. It's Maya Angelou. Oh, this is a good one. Ego is just an overdressed insecurity. That's from Quincy Jones. That is true. The problem with taking it easy is that it sounds attractive at first until you get into a routine of doing nothing and you don't expand your mind or help anybody else. That's George Bush. There's no cap on success. The jury stays out till you take your last breath. That's Judge Judy Scheindlin. Judge Judy. And who wants to reach the end of their life in a perfectly preserved body? The scars and the crinkles and the cracks are what make us interesting. And that's Bear Grills. Is that how you say his name? And Sorry, I keep saying I'm going to stop reading, but I like all of these. <laughs> these are um, bedtime stories. We asked readers to share their craziest sleep-talking stories. Some of these might keep you up at night. I dreamed I was rocking a baby to sleep. In the morning, my husband, who is bald, told me I patted his head for 30 minutes while repeating, go to sleep, baby. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, this one says, my husband sat up in bed and announced, Eileen, I believe I can kill about 20 chickens. <laughs> he then went back to sleep, leaving me wide awake. <laughs> As a kid, I was at a sleepover, and I watched my friend stuff the bed sheet into her mouth, pull it out, and say, That was good, Mom. What's for dessert? <laughs> my husband was tossing and turning in bed, so I asked whether he was all right. He replied, Yes, I talked with the horse, and he didn't have any suggestions or answers for the project. Turning to me with some urgency, my sleeping husband stated, I have to do the cat's taxes. <laughs> and the last one here. Our eight-year-old daughter. Are you saying that George Washington didn't invent the toilet? And a lot of these little things are really cute, but... The Scrabble Championship. Sign the Friendly Skies. This is that story about the everyday heroes. I think that's a long story. And that's it.